Hey there, Sebastian here. You know, the podcaster listener relationship is too unbalanced. You know us a lot better than we know you, and we want to narrow that gap. So please do me a favor and answer our audience survey. It takes four minutes, and it will help us to continue producing content that informs and inspires you. You can find the survey at epicenter.rocks survey. And at the end, I'll tell you how you can get a free KeepKey hardware wallet, courtesy of Shapeshift, to thank you for your time. So thanks in advance, and on with the show. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastien Couture. This is the first of a series of bonus episodes and bonus content that was recorded at the Ethereum Community Conference in Paris from March 3rd to March 5th. In this episode, Frédéric and I sat down towards the end of the conference to have an informal discussion with Gonzalo Sal, co-founder and security researcher at Consensus Diligence, Jérôme de Tichet, president of Ethereum France, and Cassidy Daly, the token designer at Centrifuge. We talked about the topics du jour and the things on everyone's mind at the conference, including the issues with centralization in DeFi and token governance, the security complexities of composability attacks like the ones we saw recently, which leveraged flash loans, and of course, the coronavirus. Now, just in the last few days, we've discovered that people who were at the conference have tested positive for COVID-19. I was in contact with some of these attendees, and so I'm taking the advice of health officials in France and quarantining myself for the next few weeks and monitoring my situation as it evolves. If you think you've been in contact with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19, or if you're showing any of the symptoms, please refer to your local health authorities for the proper course of action in your area. I think it would also be helpful for everybody to be transparent at this time so that people can take the proper precautions if they think they might have been infected. We're here at ECC. ECC is about to end, and we're speaking with three very lovely panelists. The first one is Gonzalo from Consensus Diligence. Uh, then there's Jerome, who organized this conference. And then there's Cassidy, who does token economics for Centrifuge. Um, and with me is Sebastian. So maybe we can do a super short round of introductions and maybe uh, talk about the talks that you gave or we're going to give. Here at ECC. <laughs> I can start. Oh, my name is Gonzalo. I've been with uh, Consensus Diligence. I'm one of the co-founders. So I've been there for three years. And I'm also director of Hugs at Consensus. That's an official title of mine. I'm Jerome. I'm the president of Ethereum France. Uh, we organize at CC every year the first week of March. And I had the exquisite pleasure to receive a lot of hugs. And a lot of, uh, and had also uh, lots of sponsors that uh, are recurring um, Nozis is one of them, so thank you so much again. And um, it's uh, really a pleasure to have uh, the whole community gathering in France every, uh, every year. My name is Casti, so, uh, working at Centrifuge, which is connecting businesses to financing, giving them greater access um, and unlocking value that has previously been inaccessible. Yeah, tell us about the talks you gave. So I gave one talk just about Centrifuge Chain and why we're building it today which is, I think, less controversial, more of a simple talk just to explain what it is we're doing and why we think it's interesting. And I think the more interesting talk I gave was yesterday together with Abby Titcomb, who's working at Radical. And we talked about how we can start putting the D back in DeFi. Um, so we looked at a few DeFi projects and analyzed them and showed that actually they're really not actually decentralized. They're pretty centralized. Um, and then we talked about how DAOs can be used to start opening up different layers of the system. In what ways are they centralized? I'm glad you asked. Uh, would be great if you also checked out the talk um, because we really dove into this. I mean, I think you can have a really vague definition of what decentralized means um, and what DeFi is as a result. So there's everything from bank the unbanked to really getting into basically taking away intermediaries and so not having central control um, of basically like things like admin keys, for example. But there's also an element of transparency as well. And we think that DAOs are really good for basically tackling both of those things. Um, so decentralizing the control of the entire infrastructure, but also bringing a, a large degree of transparency to the whole process. 
Yeah, I, th I think when people say DeFi, they, all, uh, they often mean self-custodial, and that's often enough. So it doesn't really matter how decentralized the protocol itself is or whether there's on any owners to the protocol, whether people can make changes and upgrades and so on. Yeah, the self-custodial is, is usually the thing that, uh, that qualifies things as DeFi, right? But I would, I would argue that a lot of these projects, they're just completely recreating what already exists today in the financial system. And not really adding a lot of value on top, um, especially when just taking control of, of, I mean, some projects, maybe they say, okay, we use a multi-sig for our contracts. Oh, that's great. But like, you're still one company that controls this multi-sig. Like, what is that actually decentralizing, you know? So I, I really don't like the acronym DeFi. I think it's uh, misleading. It's not decentralized finance. It's more disintermediated finance at, at best or re-centralized on one single party that people can audit. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, yet to be, uh, I hadn't had time to watch all of the talks, like uh, being the event organizer, I just running and don't see anything. But I saw your, your talk on a couple of uh, WhatsApp and, and Telegram groups saying, oh, this is actually great. Thank you so <laughs> shout out to this. And uh, this year, uh, uh, the DeFi track was one of the most uh, submitted track I think we had a uh, 100 or something different uh, submission for the DeFi, and we we kept something like 40. So definitely uh, one of the big movements in the uh, in the space right now. Yeah, um, I'm gonna blame Jerome uh, now uh, for my talk earlier today. That did not happen because of the zero people that were in the room. So never give a talk during the last day of a conference in the first slot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, but um, I yesterday uh, was in a really good panel well, with the um, with the Ave team. So Stanny, uh, also Tom from Aztec about privacy, a lot of talk about insurance and flash loans. Obviously, that is that for me has been the theme of the conference. Um, we're we're at a point where everybody's starting to get already annoyed by the topic, but but we've we've talked extensively about it how that ties into into insurance companies that are popping up like Nexus Mutual and whatnot. So that is, we've, we've been having some really, really, really interesting talks about that. I'd like to come back to what you were saying about how DeFi isn't actually decentralized. And I think it, the nuance between like decentralized and de disintermediated is interesting. You know, would it make sense for the ecosystem as a whole to start thinking about sort of the guidelines and best practices uh, in the space. So from, you know, custody, but also who holds control of like, you know, servers and things like that. Like, do you think that it would make sense for the space to, to start thinking about, about that collectively to sort of set standards for like what DeFi should be or ought to be? Yeah, I definitely think so. I, I hope that's where we were starting with our talk yesterday is trying to bring up what we think some of the initial standards could be. And one interesting case study that was really perfectly timed was Compound's governance token. And I think it's it shows that they're also thinking about this. And they're tackling specifically a few different areas in terms of starting to open up access to really controlling Compound as a user. So the, the positive side is that they're opening up access to, to make these decisions on where the protocol is going to go. But the negative side is that they're choosing who they're giving this access to in the very beginning. So I think it would be nice to start having conversations about, I think like something that's really close to me is, what is this initial distribution of power going to look like? Is it right to actually just choose yourself who the initial stakeholders are um, and give them the power from, from the beginning? And what it, how does that affect decentralization of these decisions going forward as well. So as, as someone who has started a DAO before, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's enormously difficult to actually find a good initial distribution for voting power in DAOs. So basically because you want to give it to people who care, so as not to make attacks too easy, because most people won't vote. I mean, if you just give it to random people, it's like th that's a non-starter. So you need to give it to people who are interested. And then you need to measure to a certain extent um, how interested they are and they need to convey the interest in some way or other. And it's super difficult to find a, a workable way of doing this. So what do you suggest? 
I mean, I actually, I loved what DXDAO tried to do. Um, I thought that was a really good example of how to do it in a way where you're really considering giving both open access as well as access to people that care. So you targeted people who are already using DutchX and you said, okay, if, you, if you're using Ethereum or one of the other tokens on DutchX, if you're an active user, then we're giving you the opportunity to self-select to get power in, in this governance. And I thought to me that that made more sense of a initial model than top down just selecting as Compound is doing um, our investors and basically just giving it back to the VC whales that already exist in projects like Maker. So I by no means do I want to say that Compound's model is good or you know fantastic or should be emulated a lot. But uh, with the DX DAO, so basically you could get a reputation uh, in the DAO uh, by trading on the Dutch X, but you could also get reputation by just essentially locking up Ether or other tokens that are listed on the Dutch X, which, which was uh, seen by many people as starting a plutocracy in a way, because basically you give power to people who, who already hold a lot of funds. Yeah, it's a, a difficult problem. I'm going to make a plug for something that a, a colleague of mine just put out uh, two days ago, actually, uh, Morellian. Um, because uh, following all the things that we that we were seeing, all the attacks with BZX, uh, with with a bunch of like composability in DeFi, we thought there must be a guideline for people to be able to assess these things, right? More from a security perspective, obviously, not not purely from a governance one. But the the first point in that blog post is exactly admin privileges, right? So knowing that something is not decentralized from the moment that it is deployed should be really important to the end user. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Just wanted to come back on the, the criteria that uh, should be used for this, especially for voting. I had an interesting discussion with uh, the guys from, uh, from Unlock. That was their idea, so I'm happy to share it. So the, the idea was like, okay, let's look at how many, how many, uh, well, Let's count the addresses that are interacting with the contract, um, and the address that act, interact the most should get better, uh, better voting power because they interact, and also weight that with the um, with the number of uh, the total number of transactions that they have done, announce so as to uh, consider that uh, voting is uh, is it's actually expensive to vote. You need to to read what you are going to vote on, and you need to make a transaction. So at least picking people that do a lot of transaction means that uh, for those people they are already. Uh, blockchain, uh, blockchain uh, handy, so they, they will actually vote. Uh, but it sounds like a terrible idea to just give uh, voting rights to investors because they have investors and uh, they barely move their token and they have barely used their wallet since the, they got the token in the first place. I mean, we've seen this before with Maker, right? So basically the Maker governance, there were a couple of Maker whales who by combining their, their Maker tokens or even individually could have pushed any sort of update to the contract without a grace period. So I, I, I believe that's now been fixed. So basically now there's a 24 hour lock period implemented before things are actually follow through. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a dangerous path. I guess we are, we are completely experimenting with governance with the DAOs. They're like, okay, let's set up a governance model and see what it looks like. And it turns out that uh, in the real world example of governance, there are uh, responsibility associated to this governance, but also the a salary associated to this. Like when you uh, elect uh, the mayor of the town, you, he, he gets paid and uh, he gets paid on your own dollar. Uh, so whenever we will uh, have a, I'll be curious to see a, a DAO started like this, like, okay, this is going to be run as a DAO. Uh, we're going to elect some people. Those people will get money out of the pocket of the users, but the users can have a liquid democratic way of just saying like, oh, you're not my, you're not my, you're not representing me anymore because... Uh, you're not doing a good job or you're not voting here. You, you missed two votes, guys, come on. See those empty seats at the, at the parliament? No, that's not fine. I just asked if you were trying to build a new country, secretively. He's starting with a castle. <laughs> we're, we're starting with the castle. Oh, I'll, t I'll tell you about the castle if you ask me, but... Uh. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a, a bit later, but I wanted to come back to something you were talking about earlier with regards to um, composability attacks. You know, it's... I'm, I'm by no means a security expert, but uh, how do we, teams like Consensus Diligence, find these composability attacks when no one has executed them? And 
as the space continues to grow and there are more like money Legos, like more composability attacks will emerge, presumably. Yeah. And so how do we make sure that these things don't just become like commonplace? Yeah. I'm going to say that there are like two, two sides to these latest attacks that just happened like in February and, and last week. They're like um, arbitrage opportunities, right? So purely just trying to get money out of like different exchanges basing, based on arbitrage. And there's actual bugs in the code. What happened in the, f the first time around, so February 14th, I think, was that there was actually a, a, a bug in the code. The sleepage check was not working properly, right? So that's an actual bug. And that's why the second claim to Nexus Mutual paid out. Now, thinking about composability, and this is, you just gave me an opportunity for a great plug for people to go watch Bernard Mueller's talk uh, from earlier today uh, at ETHCC. Thursday, I don't know, 11, 20 something. We'll link to it. Great. He just presented a new feature that was baked into Mithril. Mithril is one of our security tools, so it's a symbolic engine. And he's able to pull on-chain data and actually attest that there is an arbitrage opportunity. So what I think, two things. The bugs we're here to correct, and those can be solved atomically. Someone comes to us with a code base, and we can look at the code base and think about like the bugs that are in there and maybe some external dependencies. For the arbitrage opportunities, we'll start seeing a lot of bots that will start to even out the market, and these attacks will keep happening in a in a much smaller scale until like everything starts getting evened out. So one of the tricky things with composability attacks is that it's really difficult to actually pinpoint one specific party who is at fault. B because basically anytime anyone puts a new, you know, money Lego module on the market, are they under an obligation to test this with all other uh, modules? Or should there be like a, a stamp of approval by someone? Who or how pays for it, right? Is, is, is yeah, who the pays question? for this? Who, actually, who yeah. actually makes sure that this is checked? Yeah, that's a that's a really good hard question that we thought a lot about. There should be some sort of like community pulling for this type of thing, and especially when there's things like Ave coming out, right? Like Ave comes out, flesh loans, guys. Nobody knows what this does. Everything broke. <laughs> so this was definitely not for Ave to pay for anything like like this, right? Like it was, I, I don't think it was, um, it was Ave's responsibility to pay for an audit for the composability of all these pieces, right? They just enabled some new patterns, some security assumptions were completely broken with, by, by flash loans, right? You always think, oh, he, an attacker would never have this amount of money. Well, now they do. So I don't think it's Ave's responsibility. I think there should be a way, we should find a way, but, uh, community is so hard like it has been so hard for the past three years for us like ethereum is hard and community in ethereum is harder so i don't know i don't have a good answer for it i mean when you say the the hypothesis was uh nobody would ever have this amount this much money i mean for the uh, for the pos research between uh casper and the various flavors of casper it feels like we've been considering every hypothesis and always thinking like, hey, but what if what if someone had so much money? Would it be able to, to do this, to do that? So I, I guess that we we did the work on all the topics. So it's kind of good that now we get to battle test those kind of hypotheses that seemed a uh, little bit unlikely back in the days. I spoke to the Ave guys uh, two days ago and Mark made a great point. He said like there's, there's 7,000 Ethereum addresses that could have did the, uh, the one of these attacks. What's different about flash loans that we should have had the security assumption that this can happen because there are, uh, there are accounts that have this much money. Yes and no, in a way. So, so yes, in the sense that this could have already have happened. There are, there are whales that would have the capability to perform such attacks, but there's the reputational risk of doing so, right? Usually these accounts are not really anonymous and, and even the pseudonymity of it is like very so many times compromised. So if somebody would perform an attack like this, there would be a reputational hit. I think that's the safety factor in there that what that it doesn't exist anymore because like a lot of like sixteen year olds that live in their mom's basement are now thinking, Oh, I have ten million dollars that I can use to hack something. 
That's a pretty flaky safety factor. I mean, <laughs> reputation. <laughs> Especially in the times of Tornado Cash and similar mixing so look, engines, Look at the right? different accounts that could have done that. I'm curious to see the data, but uh, I guess some of the, those, most of those addresses are people that got the money in the, in the ICO of Ethereum and haven't touched their accounts. So luckily, uh, those investors that uh, don't do much with their Ether and just sit and hold are uh, helping uh, the security of various protocols. But I mean, we are, we are not completely uh, safe from uh, a shady exchange to be like, hey, I got lots of money in my cold wallet, so why am I not attacking those uh, unfair competition? They, don't, they aren't even centralized, they are decentralized. What is, it's, not, it's not normal. <laughs> This is maybe somewhat of a contentious point, but I actually think the people who are doing these attacks now, obviously they're somewhat shady and, you know, if, if they weren't, they would, they would give back the money. But I think they're actually doing the security of the system a favor because now is the time you want to find out about these composability attacks. You don't want to wait until there's more money in the system, right? The attacker of the Shanghai attack at least put uh, in the hex data that uh, Fatna House it was, like, it was like attacking the Ethereum blockchain with, uh, with insult, like, uh, go back to your home, don't, don't stay in Shanghai, it's useless what you're doing. But the, the attacker stayed uh, completely anonymous on the Flashdown attack? I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think we, we have any data on, on like who performed it. I've heard, I've heard several people say they know, but... Oh, I'd be interested now. <laughs> yeah. So who knows? But yeah, even still, I think there's an opportunity for flash loans to make this much more accessible right so like there's whales have like have an incentive not to break things right because they are invested in the ecosystem too right it's it's reputational and also they're invested it's their own money they're invested in the success of the network i can not all practically any eth and still carry on these attacks and that's the whole issue here right like i could just like short ETH or maybe try to buy a lot of Maker and break DeFi. Like a lot of these, the, the problem is that like, even not not speaking, flash loans have a lot of composability problems, right? They they make these arise, but even they, they could be used for something that is like made to break some DeFi protocol atomically, right? Isolated, siloed, they, they could be used like that. Yeah, and I mean, we don't, we don't know what they can do, right? So basically, I mean, there's so far we've, we've seen and heard about two things, a Oracle manipulation, uh, which is uh, how the BZX happened. And then basically this governance uh, hack, where basically you buy a lot of maker tokens and then do like attack on the maker system. As far as I know, those are the only two things we have heard about, and I'm sure there are others. So During the, the conference, we released a, a private key hidden in a, in a video. I don't know if you had time to, to play this game. Private key was found uh, in like two hours. And I was following the track of what happens to those, uh, those Ether. They went straight to another address and then boom, on Binance. I was, I was, a, little bit, uh, yeah, I was a little bit sad. I would have loved to see uh, those Ether being transferred on, uh, I don't know, Compound, Tornado Cash or something. Just uh, didn't use it this way. I wanted to ask you guys, like, what do you think about uh, oracles? And I'm glad the topics came uh, came into the discussion, because um, I've been thinking of maybe proposing that we include some of the um, relevant information, like uh, USD to to ETH, because it's apparently uh, a very very well uh, followed pair. USD to ETH directly in the um, in the extra data of a block, so it can be uh, used directly. Uh, in the block and have uh, the miners uh, sign in a way or maybe use uh, different oracles that would sign the data and put this data in the block so it becomes available by block directly in the block and not being brought into uh, the blockchain somewhere else what do you think about it i don't have a strong opinion on oracles but i but i but we've been talking to um to some companies that are that are getting ready to to launch their decentralized options for oracles right so Stuff like Wheatnet comes to mind immediately. I think that Chainlink has a lot of head start. So let's let's see how this plays out. What do you what do you think is um, sort of dissect the response to the to the attack? Do you think the community and the space is responding well? Are taking like the right steps to um, prevent these things in the future? Or is there like thorough discussion and thinking around this sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. 
I, I think we're getting much better. Well, one thing that has gone much, much better is our <laughs> incident response time as a as a community, as a tribe. Like uh, I think Ethereum was was very disorganized when I first started getting into the space. Uh, a lot of things were wrong. But then like uh, people from older industries, industries that are more used to having standards and, and, and proper methodology uh, for, for a secure life cycle of a product and development in general started trickling in. They came from the aerospace uh, industry or from the cars industry, right? From, from the automotive industry. And they brought such good practices and I learned a lot. Like seriously, I'm I'm barely a security practitioner myself, so I've I've been learning a lot. And yeah, I think we've gotten much better. And this time around, people were responsibly disclosing the flaws. Uh, everything was handled apart from some BZX communications. Everything was handled very smoothly. Everybody everybody got to learn really quick what the implications were and go back to older projects. And now this is more from a security auditing perspective. Everybody got the time to go back to their older projects and check for possible nefarious interactions. That's interesting. That brings up kind of your earlier point about decentralization and DeFi. If the incident response also relies on like specific people being contacted and being able to take action on things, um, does that mean that uh, we're approaching you know better decentralization or... Of course, it's great that incident response times are getting better, but uh, do we need to move towards a future where specific people are not required to act on these sorts of things, like the attacks? Or that, That's a real problem. I think when it comes down to it, you're going to have to rely on specific people who are able to solve the problems that are there. I mean, we can't just rely on an anonymous person stepping up to fix something. So I think the governance mechanisms that we develop going forward are going to have to be able to account for responding to things like this in an efficient way. Um, and that does mean, I guess, like you could call it a degree of centralization, but I wouldn't see it that way. I would see it more as delegation of if a, if a problem comes up, we as a community decide who is going to be able to fix this. Yeah, but I think that should be defined by governance to some yeah, extent. Yeah, I agree. The, like the delegation of these responsibilities fallbacks uh, if such responsible person is not available or you know yeah but I, I guess what I'm saying or... is that it shouldn't be that we're not falling back on someone um, I think we're going to need to to have specific parties that we go to in order to be efficient if we want to tackle problems like this we can't just leave it until the problem comes up to then decide and have a governance vote just on this specific problem I think that's not going to make sense but so having processes in place that themselves are decentralized, being able to have a governance vote around what to do if something like this comes up beforehand. And I thought the response to, to this was super interesting because I saw a lot of negative responses on one side, but I, I would tend to agree with Frederica a lot more that this was actually a good thing that this came up because it brings up issues like this. What do we do if this comes up in the future and how do we do this in a way that is actually in line with our values as a community. And then being able to, to say things like, okay, if, if someone can get a flash loan for a ton of MKR and swing a maker vote, well, obviously that means that the governance there needs to be changed and updated. And it's, I think, great that that's coming up now and it can be changed and addressed now um, compared to doing this when it's maybe a much bigger disaster potentially. I, I think that's a real problem, to be honest. Like there's... The security community, in specific, has created uh, repositories of uh, security contacts for for several companies, and and some of them are still blank, like big companies, big treasuries that like have no real way for us to contact them and at, at any point in time. That's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get all of your thoughts on uh, on ETC, and if we were to take a snapshot of the space at the moment. You know, what would we see in that snapshot? Where are we at? I think I've always loved ECC as a conference because to me it seems really focused on just being able to talk about issues, which is what we, we've done today. And I really appreciate the conversations that I've had here. And I find it super value, valuable as a conference for that. I, I don't feel like anyone's shilling something to me. And I think this year was no different 
than how it's been in the past. And to be honest, I was um, a little worried that it could be because we were in a much nicer location this year, which is actually wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciated the really academic feeling of the last years, but it, it turns out that we didn't need to be in a kind of rundown academic institution in order Ooh. to have that vibe. <laughs> No, I thought it was it was wonderful. It, it it added to the the feeling that I was there just for the people, just to have these conversations. I wasn't there for the place, and and I think this year it's it's much nicer, and and I've appreciated that. But I've had just as many really valuable conversations, and even though I wasn't able to go to as many talks as I would have liked, I had really great conversations with other people around the conference. And I believe all the talks have been recorded and uh, have been put on YouTube. Yeah. So it's it's very much on my agenda to watch all the cool talks that I missed at home. <laughs> Agreed. So everything was live recorded and posted the same day. That's really impressive because there are conferences, and I'm not going to name them, that take a really long time to post the content. <laughs> I agree with what Cassidy was, was saying. It was like ECC was always the, the ETH conference that I went to with the strongest technical content year after year uh the venue changing didn't change anything about it congratulations jerome it's always amazing <laughs> thank you for the kind words uh you'll all be invited again next year <laughs> for sure <laughs> um so about the, the change of the venue uh we we had a lot of complaint last year and the year before that uh, the venue was pretty cool but hard to get around in uh especially because the the rooms were very uh apart from each other so sometimes people got lost and the uh, And honestly, the, um, the school is not meant to uh, gather so many people. Uh, so when we have the fire alarm or when we have any problem, it's, uh, it's really a mess. Whereas the venue this year is uh, way more professional, owned by a professional company of event organizers like G8 Event. So definitely it looks way more professional, but it was also a test for us because the school that we were supposed to host it uh, in, the same school, uh, was having renovation work. So we had to find a new place. And we said like, well, let's... Uh, Let's let's try to ramp up our game and uh, try to see if we uh, if we can host it in a very professional place, meaning that it will cost a little bit more money. So the tickets were a little bit more expensive than last year, 20 euro more. And we wanted to, and also we expected to have uh, maybe 20% more attendees. So we had uh, we had uh, 700 the first year, 1200 the second year. So we were like 1600 uh, looks uh, looks feasible. So let's uh, let's have a bigger venue and uh, maybe also plan for 2021 that we keep the same venue and uh, instead of packing everything around the, the first three days, around just three days, let's take the venue for the whole week and uh, unpack the thing on uh, maybe five days and keep it up on the weekend for workshops and, uh, and all the stuff. So that's what we had in mind. And uh, as, uh, as you may know, there was a, a pandemic outbreak during the, the months before and during the week. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, to, to say that we, we survived this, uh, this pandemic outbreak so far. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. In a couple, in, in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, nobody died at HCC yet. I hope uh, nobody will die. Um, I hope we I did been. cough a couple times and I got some looks. I was in a, a booth and I was coughing the entire <laughs> week. <laughs> so we had, uh, we, we given, uh, pretty explicit uh, best practices don't cough on each other don't sneeze on each other <laughs> uh, don't don't share the tissues don't share the needles like make sure that uh, you people are really good about like not touching hands though i mean that, i thought like if there's one thing that that marked this conference it was elbow bumping and i wonder if in future uh in future ecc editions people will continue to do the elbow bump thing <laughs> Me, uh, being the, the director of Hugs at Consensus, uh, entitled me to an email from the legal department asking me not to hug people. Wow. <laughs> I do want to point out that while nobody was, was touching and you know that was all fine and good and everybody was like washing their hands and everything, everybody used the same spoon to pick up, to, to grab their food. <laughs> security, <laughs> security again. <laughs> So many challenges. Everyone's an epidemiologist in these times, isn't? I mean, and basically, uh, pe people c came up to me and they were doing like the elbow bump thing, and you know, it was a little bit awkward. And then, you know, after you know, like trying this, they're like, "Oh, you know what? Come here!" And then they give you an enormous hug. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah. Well, you you cannot avoid the Gonzalo or Griff Green all the time. 
at some point you just get hugged. <laughs> there was also a second external hiccup, uh, namely that ETH Paris was cancelled like two weeks before. Can we talk about that? I mean, do we want to get into the drama of it? Yes. So I I heard that actually quite a few people were upset because ETH Denver charged so much for their sponsorships that they felt that there was a run over to ETH Paris and that the reason why they weren't able to raise as, as much as they had wanted to be able to host the event was in part due to ETH Denver charging so much. I wonder if you've you've heard the same or if you totally disagree. Eh? Uh, so I, I just, um, before jumping into this topic, uh, I just want to say one last thing about coronavirus, <laughs> if, you, if I may so. Is this the more pleasant conversation? Yeah, we're just like, we, are, we had, well, 12 to 17 percent of cancellation among the speakers. Not, not counting the one that showed up in the room and the room was empty, so they didn't want to do the talks. We will, we will revise the number later. Uh, so like it's roughly 30, 30 speakers that didn't come. Some of them were very famous ones that we were very happy to have, and then we couldn't uh, because personal reasons, because fear, because uh, reasonable doubt about their health, or because company policy that tell us that not to come. But nevertheless, we managed to have most of them by video, uh, remotely. And we integrated it to the talks. It's it's not as good, but still we managed to produce the content, so that's fine. And a lot of them actually had to get up in the middle of the night for that. So I mean, there were a lot of exactly. talks from the states, and they they happened at two a.m. local time or something. Yeah, which showed the dedication of those uh, of those speakers, and I'm very happy that we still managed to do that. And um, from from our side, we invested heavily on time uh, trying to bring the Chinese uh, community, the Japanese community, the South Korean community, and the Taiwanese make them aware of the event and in hope that they will come and finally we will bring them to France for SCC because this is what is being what is lacking every year and uh, this year we failed miserably because of the virus but nevertheless we'll go again next year yeah um I maybe I shouldn't get into this but uh, but uh, picking up on what Cassidy said that's entirely true and I've never never met John Pollard but like he got really upset at me on Twitter because I said that there was a lot of centralization in funding the ETH chapters, ETH global chapters. And, and I think that's true because like what you as a company do is that you allocate a certain amount for community efforts, right? For marketing. If one person asks for a big piece of the pie, obviously the pieces of the pie that are left for the smaller chapters are going to be a lot less, right? And, and we felt that trying to get trying to put it lisbon up a lot of people back out of the sponsoring and some others said that they just simply didn't have the cash to, to do it after eth denver and, and all the other chapters but there were also companies who actually did not sponsor eth denver because of that so we actually we had gnosis we thought about it and then in the end we didn't because we thought we could get much better value elsewhere so eat paris last year was organized by eat global and it went very smoothly. Like, well, we at Ethereum France, we took the responsibility of the contract because setting up a legal entity and taking the contract and so on, we already had it. So we took uh, gathering and uh, and video and uh, and some of the, the fees for the venue. We took it uh, on our account, but we we let Eat Global raise money for the for the from the sponsors and uh, it distribute the awards and uh, let the and organize them them what they wanted to do right. So right after it Paris, like we announced that we're gonna do Eat CC again, and uh, we started to get in touch with Global on organizing Eat Paris, and uh, we really waited for a long time before having what seems to be a confirmation that we're gonna do it, and uh, then think that they were really committing on doing it. So we move forward with uh, other partners and other uh, organizers and other uh, caterer and so on, and unfortunately they bluntly decided to not do Eat Paris in late December and do Eat London the weekend before instead, which was uh, really a huge surprise for us. So we were like, left unorganized and thought like, damn, we need to find someone to organize this hackathon because HCC is already a, a, big, uh, a big push to, to do. So in early January, uh, uh, the department of this of this I was about to say this organization. organization. No, the department of, of <laughs> decentralization uh, very nicely raised their hands and said like, yeah, we're gonna try to see what we can do. And unfortunately, it was uh, it was too late for them to uh, actually uh, manage to to lend uh, the minimum amount that we required to 
to actually organize this. And I don't know if that's because of Eat Denver, but uh, I really thank Dodd of uh, trying to do so. And uh, in the end, I was just like, well, people going to London and uh, getting food poisoned. That, that's uh, never mind. A lot of people from the EF came back from London saying like, well, I'm super ill. And I, can, I cannot do my talk. Can I be rescheduled? Can I be this? Can I be that? So like, I would say it's karma, <laughs> maybe. But uh, in the end, we are we are landing at Paris anyway. I'm not going to let uh, anyone tell us that we cannot do a hackathon. We are going to do a hun hackathon. So this first next Saturday, and I'm going to announce that this at the at the closing um, closing speech. We're going to still go to the venue and host workshop on discovering Ethereum for all the students that uh, uh, applied for it Paris and are in town and want to learn more about Ethereum. And uh, anyone that wants to have a workshop or present what they are doing, uh, they are more than welcome to do so. So at Paris is still happening. Little at Paris, but still at Paris. Are there any uh, things you'd like to uh, leave our listeners on? What's next for all of you? Where are you heading to next? Any any other exciting conferences or events that uh, you're going to attend if they're not canceled? The Dilly team will is excited about uh, the Solidity Summit in Berlin. So I think we'll we'll have the whole team there, and we're gonna think about some Solidity. April twenty ninth and thirtieth. I think. So join us for some security fun in Berlin. <laughs> nice. I think I'm going to go to uh, this event as well. Uh, if I'm allowed to travel, I don't know. But I'll probably do that because uh, I really love uh, solidity issues. <laughs> and on my side, uh, the next step will definitely uh, be preparing for HCC next year. And I hope that all the, the people that hear about HCC or listen to this podcast will uh, mark their agenda HCC is happening every year the first week of March and we open the call for speaker around November. I'm not really uh, looking at any events in the near future. I, of course, am always excited for Berlin Blockchain Week, which is going to come yes. up at the end of the summer. But that's pretty far out. So in terms yeah. of the the near term, I think I'm just going to be heads down working on our launch. Cool. Yeah, half of humanity could have you know, vanished by, by then. Um, <laughs> congratulations, Jerome, on uh, putting on this really great event. I mean, we're super happy to be here, and we'll be here next year and the year after. And as long as I live twenty minutes away, I'll keep coming. <laughs> thank you, Jerome. Yeah, thank you. It was lovely as always. I'm also very much looking forward to Berlin Blockchain Week. So this year it's um, September eight to sixteen. I really like ECC because it's got this community spirit, uh, and I think. You know, from out of all the conferences, actually DAPCON um, comes closest to that. So basically, it's also fairly affordable prices and it's a lot of the development uh, community. It's absolutely no shells. Uh, so yeah, Berlin Blockchain Week is where it's at. Thanks to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>